All right, I'll uh, call the uh, meeting back to order. Section three of the executive order states mission. The commission shall, consistent with applicable law, study the registration and voting processes used in federal elections. The commission shall, solely, shall be solely advisory and shall submit a report to the president that identifies the following. <clears throat> a, those, rule, those laws, rules, policies, activities, strategies, and practices that enhance the American people's confidence in the integrity of the voting pr processes used in federal elections. B, those laws, rules, policies, activities, strategies, and practices that undermine the American people's confidence in the integrity of the voting processes used in federal elections. And C, those vulnerabilities in voting systems and practices used in federal elections that could lead to improper voter registrations and improper voting, including fraudulent voter registrations and fraudulent voting. It would be interesting to catalog across the country how many uh, initiatives, uh, whether they be um, for hospital levies, school levies, um, candidate elections, are determined by one ballot. Now, the, the reason I say that is because, you know, when we look at the big numbers like uh, 5 million, 6 million, 7 million, you know, it is easy for somebody to summarily dismiss it. But when we drive home the importance of every single legal vote cast and the integrity of the ballot box, we can show people the consequence of one illegal diluting ballot, a uh, ballot that dilutes a legal, a legal ballot. Now, my understanding is that there are some states that can readily get us those numbers. And we don't necessarily have to go back to the, uh, you know, the, the first recording of a state's history. We, we, we can take a, a period of time over the last two cycles or, you know, just to get us a snapshot so that we can help drive home the point uh, to the American voter that their single ballot counts. This is what this is about. You know, the, the voter's ballot and vote is the, ballot, is the voter's voice. And we want to make sure that no voices are being illegally, you know, <clears throat> negated. Really, until uh, I was contacted about potentially serving on this commission and, and read certain things in the, in, in the media, Gosh, I don't know where, I, I, I just assumed that um, someone could only be registered in one state. I really, I just thought that was the law of different states, quite frankly. And to find out that, that people are registered, we'll say state A, and then they have a vacation home in state B, that they can be registered in both states and potentially vote an absentee in one state, we'll say, and go, go to their resort state and vote another ballot. I don't know if that happens or not, but it seems like to me that it'd be, I'd like for us to discuss a, a recommendation to, uh, to the president that, that someone can only be registered in one state. And, you know, if someone has a vacation home, great, but vote an absentee ballot or, early voting or whatever the state allows in that state, that should be sufficient. I don't see where anyone should needs to be registered in two, two or more states, quite frankly. I would like to, for us to discuss that. Prior studies have not done is taken the second step. Yes, they've looked at voter registration lists and, and found individuals registered in multiple states. What we don't know is how many of those are errors simple administrative errors, innocent errors, and how many of those are individuals who are taking advantage of that to illegally vote in more than one state? And the second half of that kind of a study, which others have really not done, is getting uh, also the voting histories to check that. And uh, the database that we have has examples of individuals uh, who were prosecuted for voting in more than, in more than one state. And that, that certainly is a problem. We need to look at, at how big of a problem that is and what can be done to prevent it. And I would just add, not that I'm going to comment on every comment here, but the, uh, the cross-check database sends to the participating states what are possible cases of double voting. We say possible because every match is always a potential false positive, so it has, further investigation is always warranted. <clears throat> but in the last two years, my state has uh, obtained guilty convictions on eight cases of double voting. 
in, in many of those serial double voters who voted in two states election after election after election. Uh, so it's, it's not complicated to obtain that information. Uh, the only part is that the, the, everything is with the caveat that there has to be further investigation to make sure it's not a false positive. I think we should look uh, pursuant to the, the presidential um, executive order. Um, the causes for the lack of voter participation and confidence in our elections. And I'm not sure how we collect that data or we can get some witness testimony on that, but uh, we do have a very low participation rate uh, amongst democracies in the world, and I, I would like to know why. Uh, and then also I think we should look at automatic voter registration. And a number of states are taking up automatic voter registration. Several have already passed it and have put it into place. Uh, but I think that raises some questions about the accuracy of the voting rolls, how, mm -hmm. how this is all playing out, uh, and how it will change the, the, the voter registration um, processes across the country. And then uh, I think what I'd like to also look at, and I don't know if this is appropriate or not, but uh, how voter crimes are identified and investigated uh, for prosecution in this country. Uh, <coughs> I, I think that uh, resources are scarce, and so these uh, prosecutions often uh, are not followed up on uh, because of the dockets of, of our prosecutors. Uh, I could be wrong about that, but I'd like to, I'd like to find that out. Uh, I also, just from my own experience, know that it's very hard to identify uh, voter fraud when it's happening, uh, especially uh, impersonation voting, uh, which we've heard many, many claims of is a myth. Uh, I know from personal experience and seeing it in person myself that it is not a myth. Uh, but I think we should look at how, how we identify and deter uh, and prosecute voter crimes in the country. On your list, you have cybersecurity regarding state voter databases listed. And um, when I originally thought about the purpose of the commission, I thought, well, we probably shouldn't go there. There's so many other uh, people looking at this. But I think it might be helpful if we did look at the overall cybersecurity issue and just determine how communication to the chief election officials should occur uh, and the timing of that and um, just the cooperation of the EAC, the DHS. You know, I have an opportunity uh, this month yet to visit the MSI SEC in Albany, New York. And so I think we're, gonna, we're all learning more and more about it, but I don't think it would be uh, harmful if we put some of that information that we're gaining uh, in one spot so we can maybe um, uh, suggest some best practices regarding information sharing and security levels, those kinds of things. If the commission were to say, well, we, we have an expert uh, in public testimony say, well, here, here are the things the states are doing well, but if you want to break into a state's voter rolls, here are the weaknesses. Well, by, which is exactly what those sensitive discussions are about, uh, then we, in, in a way, have sort of given a roadmap to those who might wish to uh, breach the state's uh, secure voter rolls. So, my concern on that topic is that we might have to go into a closed session for part of the meeting, but maybe that shouldn't deter us. Uh, we, you know, that may just be what we have to do. Mr. 2015, the office, the Federal Office of Personnel Management was, was hacked. And what, 25 million uh, employees had uh, exposure uh, to a potential breach of personal uh, information. So. We have to operate in the real world. There are real threats and real vulnerabilities, uh, and we can't be limited um, in terms of what's being done to protect the American people, whether it's their social security numbers, their financial situation, or the integrity of their ballot. Uh, we have to understand that there are real threats to the integrity of the ballot box. and. Um, to the degree that we can work cooperatively with other commissions and authorities, Homeland Security, and, 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 and get a, a beat on this, I think we have, to, we have to press to see just how far we can go because it's important to our work. I, I, I've been there on election night. I've been there during election day when, when machines aren't working properly and you have to bring in other machines. And thankfully, Jefferson County, we're a fairly large county and we've got the financial resources to uh, and we've got access machines, but there's a lot of counties in this nation who don't have the resources. And, and it's all, and, and we can talk about um, elections a lot, 
But if people can't vote because machines don't work, then we've got a massive, massive problem. And we've got to address that. We've got, in my opinion, we've got to address funding in a recommendation by the president to Congress. Let's, let's do another funding like we did for HAVA in 2002. And states, all counties all across this nation use that money to, to purchase voting machines. So here, what we've got now is we've got 13 and 15 year old voting machines and you've got voting machines that don't work. You've got, th these machines need parts and we've got these counties and states, we've got to have the funds. Um, otherwise, you know, we're missing the big picture if we don't make sure that we have the machines that are state of the art and that work and work properly. When we had uh, a disputed election just a few years ago in a Senate district, over 25,000 ballots cast, and there was a seven vote margin, and there's a recount, and uh, I showed up the recount just as it got started, and my intrepid deputy, uh, Julie Flynn, who's many of you know her from around the country, she goes to a lot of your states and is an expert on these issues. I walked in and she said, this one town, the town of Long Island, had made a mistake and they missed counting 21 ballots. Well, when we all were said and done, the margin had flipped by 14 votes. Those 21 ballots made a difference. And the challenger, who apparently had started to win the election and now was losing the election, you know, I was at the grocery store, calls me, the lawyer calls me up, said, we just wanna maybe put this whole thing to bed. We wanna check the incoming voter list, which matches up the number of people that voted versus the number of ballots cast. No problem, we get in there on Monday morning, and wouldn't you know, those 21 ballots were not accounted for. And that changed the dynamic very quickly. Because I can describe with some <coughs> authority the chain of custody of a ballot from the time it leaves a printing press to when it's sealed in a ballot box. And while we identified that pretty articulately, it's like, where did these 21 ballots come from? And it raised a lot of suspicion. You could cut the air with a knife and went to a special Senate committee and when they recounted the ballots, we discovered that in the recount, which is manned by a Republican and a Democrat, supervised by one of our staff, they had inadvertently left those 21 ballots from a prior lot on the table and mixed them with another lot and inadvertently counted them twice. So there was no fraud. You know, and Julie and I would talk on the phone at night. It's like, how could this have happened? Could a ballot clerk have marked ballots and then got cold feet and stuffed them in a ballot box so nobody would be the wiser? And then the recount hit. So. Part of, you know, I think what we can maybe ask of folks is how their chains of custody work to help maybe allay some of these fears that something may have gone wrong in election. Um, if you have an accountability standard where you can trace back, you know, you can't ever tell how someone voted, but you know, you know, who showed up, you know, how many ballots were issued. And of course, that's a little bit easier for a paper ballot state like the state of Maine, but I think it's a question worth asking because I think it helps answer some of these questions and allays some of the fears. When NVRA, when that passed, people did predict that it was not going to have anything to do with the turnout. But those promoting it said, oh no, this is once we get people on the list, they're going to come out and vote, they're going to come out and vote. Well, what happened six years later in Florida was directly because of what the federal government did with NVRA. Because people were showing up at the polls and were being sent home because they weren't on the list. They said, but we registered. Well, where'd you register? Well, I registered at Disney World. Or I, some group came and I said they would put it in the mail. And so all of that problem that we saw <clears throat> in Florida, you put aside the punch card machines, but showing, but people showing up to vote was the result of that federal law that opened the process of registration. And, and it, it didn't get more people to vote. Automatic voter registration is not going to get more people to vote. It is the will of the voter. It is the value that the voter sees in actually doing it that is, is the key to getting more people to vote. So after we had NVRA, we ended up with the Help America Vote Act. 
the federal government gives the states $2.9 billion. I've had reports that over half of that money spent on types of voting equipment has already been destroyed, thrown away, because as you, Judge King, have said, these voting machines that are 10 or 12 years old are now antiquated. Well, I can bring you to a polling place in my state that has a voting machine that was patented in 1890, <laughs> and they are still using that voting machine. So at the time that Help America Vote Act passed, a lot of states decided to spend the money, spend millions and millions of dollars on state-of-the-art voting equipment without thinking about, is it possible that this voting equipment, state-of-the-art, in five years or in 10 years or in 12 years, could be worthless? And are we going to keep doing that every 10 or 12 years because equipment is worthless? And you look at the number of states that have done that and then have actually gone back to paper, like Maryland did about a year ago went back to paper, the old way. Uh, the other thing I think that we should look at is uh, who's being disenfranchised in our country. Uh, we hear that people are being disenfranchised. Um, uh, I just want to, as a point of order, to say that I distributed copies of our um, most recent election administration and voting survey to, to the commission. Uh, this is just an overview. The more detailed county-by-county county information is on the Election Assistance Commission's website. Uh, but uh, we did find out in this survey, for example, how many of our uniformed overseas citizens are voting or not voting. And uh, there's some pretty disappointing numbers, in my opinion, in, there. Uh, and I'd like to look at uh, who is actually being uh, prevented from voting or, or not voting for whatever reason.